This morning, you pray for her as she comes to sing. Oh, how he loves you. Oh, how he loves me. Oh, how he loves you and me. God sent his son. They called him Jesus. He came to love, heal and forgive. He lived and died to buy my pardon. An empty grave is there to prove my Savior lives. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know, I know, he holds the future. And life is worth the living just because he lives. Oh, how he loves you and me. Oh, how he loves you. Above all powers, above all kings, above all nature and all created things, above all wisdom and all the ways of man, you were here before the world began. <clears throat> Above all kingdoms, above all thrones, above all wonders the world has ever known, above all wealth and treasures of the earth, there's no way to measure what you're worth. Crucified, laid behind a stone, you live to die, rejected and alone, like a rose, trampled on the ground, you took the fall, and thought of me. the fall and thought of me above all oh how he loves you oh how he loves me oh how he loves you me
Please take your Bible and open it with me this morning to the book of Genesis chapter number 7. Genesis chapter number 7. Before Mission Emphasis Month, we started a series of messages on Noah and the flood. And we're going to come back here and begin uh, where we left off in the last service before we started our February services. And I want us to come to Genesis chapter 7 this morning. We spent some time looking at, uh, as we started this series, on looking at the days before the flood and what the days were like before God sent uh, His judgment on the world uh, in the form uh, of the flood. And we realized that there were days very similar to days that we live in today. They were days characterized by wicked marriages, uh, days characterized by witnessing. Uh, there were a number of things giving witness in that day. The, the Spirit of God was dealing with the hearts of men. Noah was preaching. And Noah was living like a person ought to live, living for the Lord. And we looked at God's, uh, God's judgment on the, nation, the, the world in that hour. Then we, we spent a little time looking at this man Noah and talked about how he lived for God in a wicked world and what happened to bring Noah to a place of faith in God. And he was a man who had faith in God, trusted the Lord, gave his, gave his heart and life to the Lord and how God called him. And how God gave him tremendous courage as he dealt with the, those days. Then we spent a little time looking at God's ark and, and uh, that, that he commissioned Noah to build. And this morning I want us to come to Genesis chapter 7 and look at a wonderful invitation that begins uh, this seventh chapter. And think for a little while this morning about come thou and all thy house into the ark. If you've got your Bible open, uh, follow along as I read, beginning in verse number 1 of chapter 7. The Bible says, And the Lord said unto Noah, Come thou and all thy house into the ark. For thee have I seen righteous before me in this generation. Of every clean beast thou shalt take to thee by sevens, the male and his female. And of beasts that are not clean, by two, the male and his female. Of fowls also of the air, by sevens, the male and the female. To keep seed alive upon the face of all the earth. For yet seven days I will cause it to rain upon the earth forty days and forty nights. And every living substance that I have made will I destroy from off the face of the earth. And, God, and Noah did according unto all that the Lord commanded him. We'll leave off reading there, but we'll be re referring to the rest of these verses in the chapter and the message this morning. Would you join me as we pray? If you haven't already committed your heart to the Lord for this time, I would encourage you to do that and then pray for one another that God would challenge and speak to our hearts this morning in the areas of need that we have. Father, I thank you for allowing me yet another day to stand in this pulpit and Lord, I don't take for granted the, the, the blessed years that I've had to preach God's word and I thank you for that. I, I stand here again recognizing, confessing this morning Without you, without you, I can do nothing. Lord, I, I need your strength. I need your power. I, I need your ability this morning. Without that, nothing of any value will happen here this morning. Lord, help me this morning. Make me a blessing to the listening ears of those in this room. I pray for that one who has spiritual need this morning. Help them. Help them to say yes to you. And may your good will be done in every life. If that, there's one who needs to be saved this morning, help them to understand that salvation awaits them. Uh, the Lord invites them to come this morning. Just as he did in Noah's day, he's inviting men to come into the place of safety this morning in the Lord Jesus. And that, that child of God who may be discouraged or downtrodden, uh, maybe that uh, child of God who's drifted away from you, Lord, I, I pray you'd draw them back to yourself this morning. And Lord, today would be the day they'd get back in the will of God. Thank you for what you're going to do, and we'll praise you for it. In Jesus' name we pray and ask. Amen. We've watched as uh, we have read chapter 6 and chapter 7 as 
Uh, Noah receives God's instructions. He receives the call of God in his life. Uh, God gives him directions about the building of the ark and uh, Noah sets out constructing this enormous ocean liner sized vehicle. It wasn't just a small boat. It was an enormous thing. Uh, if, you, if you take the time to read in your Bible and study the size uh, of, the, uh, of the, the ark itself, it was an, an enormous undertaking. It would have been an enormous undertaking in this day with the mechanized equipment we have, with all the, the power saws and, and everything that we have today. But in Noah's day, there were none of those things. And certainly it was a much more challenging thing in his day. Yet Noah followed God's directions and uh, he built this ark that uh, was, uh, had adequate space to carry his family along with all the animals that God commanded him to bring inside. Then along with his family and all the animals to carry a, a food uh, a storage of, of food that would be enough to supply everything that they needed during the time they were on the ark. As we come to chapter 7 uh, in the book of Genesis, we come to the account uh, of the flood itself. Henry Morris, who uh, was uh, the fellow who started Creation Research Institute, and uh, just about everything that uh, Henry Morris has written is good. Uh, he was a, uh, a student uh, of biblical creation. And it's given us some tremendous help uh, and as we stand against evolution and all those things. And uh, he said some wonderful things about uh, uh, Noah and uh, what the Lord is doing here. Uh, he, he wrote uh, in his commentary on, on Genesis, God had spoken to Noah nearly 100 years earlier, giving him instructions concerning the ark and the animals and assuring him that the flood indeed would come on schedule. And then for 100 years, there had been no further word from heaven. And yet Noah had proceeded, he had steadily and faithfully proceeded with the mission and the ministry that God had given to him, obeying God's commands without a, without a question in his mind. A hundred years a hundred years, year after year, he urgently preached the coming of judgment, but to no avail. No converts outside of his family. We read of no, nobody being saved during this time outside of Noah's family. Now we've reached that period when the ark is finally completed. The animals are assembling the 120 years would soon be up and Grandfather Methuselah, whose name means when he dies it shall come, is on his deathbed. And now after 100 years of silence, God once again spoke to Noah. And we read his words in verse number 1 of chapter 7 when he says to Noah, Come thou and all thy house into the ark. There are several important lessons to be learned here. Uh, several things to be reminded of as we look at uh, the story of the flood. First of all, we can see the long suffering and the mercy of God. Uh, we often ask ourselves the question, how do, how, why does God contend with the wickedness of the day that we're living in? How, how does God contend with that? Well, there's only one way to explain it. That's a long-suffering and the mercy of God. Just as it was in Noah's day. I mean, here, here is a generation of men that had rejected God. And yet God was long-suffering and merciful with them. Secondly, we see a lesson here of the fact that God is a just and holy God who will judge unrepentant men who refuse His offer of peace. But then thirdly, we're reminded here of our need to be patiently faithful in the day that we're living. Faithful to His Word. 
Uh, even if it seems as though God may be inactive in the hour that we're living or that nothing is going on as far as uh, God's activity in the world, our responsibility in the, in the face of all that is one thing, and that is to remain faithful to the Lord. This morning for just a few moments, I, I want us to notice three, three thoughts here in the verses that we're looking at in chapter 7. My first point is rather lengthy, so don't get nervous when I, we get into this and spend a little more time than you usually spend on a, on a single point. But my last two will move very quickly. But I want to spend uh, a little more time on this first point. I want us to look, first of all, at the, the directives given by God before this flood. What God is saying to Noah in preparation for the flood that's coming. There are two things that I want to highlight in, in that area of thought. First of all, we see the, the final invitation that's given uh, into the ark in verse number one. Time and again, no doubt, Noah has warned his generation about God's judgment that's coming and warned them that they need to prepare and, and exercise faith in God. But now the hour has come when they are to enter the ark and we read in verse number one that final invitation, come thou and all thy house into the ark. For thee have I seen righteous before me in this generation. Now we notice uh, two or three things in that invitation. First of all, you, you can see the reach of the invitation. God says to Noah, come thou and all thy house. First of all, Noah was invited. Notice how the invitation is given here. It's very important you notice how this invitation is given. God doesn't say to Noah, Noah, go in the ark. Notice what he says, come thou and all thy house into the ark. That immediately tells us that God is on the inside of the ark and God is inviting Noah to come in. God would be in the ark with them, preserving them from the judgment that was coming. Not only was Noah invited, but also his family is invited. Noah's entire household was saved. All his children made individual decisions to enter the ark of safety. Look down, uh, if you will, at verse number 13. In the self same day entered Noah, and Shem, and Ham, and Japheth, the sons of Noah, and Noah's wife and the three wives of his sons with them into the ark. They all made personal decisions in their lives to enter the ark of safety. What you see in play here in the Old Testament is the truth of Acts 16.31. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved and all thy house. What a great word of invitation is this word come. Well, would you hear me this morning if I told you that God is an invitational God? God is always inviting men to come unto himself. He has always invited men to come to him. God is still inviting men to come to him today. All down through history, God has issued the salvation call for sinners to repent and be reconciled to himself. Matthew chapter 11 and verse 28, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Revelation 22 and verse 17, And the Spirit and the bride say, Come. And let him that heareth say, Come. And let him that is a thirst come. And whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. What a wonderful word of invitation is this word, Come. So we see, first of all, the reach of this invitation, reaching out to Noah, reaching out to, to his family. But then secondly, we see the rescue of this invitation. Where, where are they to go? Come thou and all thy house. Where? Into the ark. There was only one place of safety from the judgment that was to fall. And that was in the ark that God had given directions to Noah on how to build. You look at the ark and it's a, it's a wonderful picture of salvation in the Old Testament. The Bible tells us that it was pitched. That word pitched 
is the Hebrew word atonement. It was pitched within and without, protecting those inside from the waters of God's judgment that, was, that were falling on the outside. It's a picture of the atoning blood of Jesus Christ that has power to cover the sin and protect the sinner from the wrath of Almighty God. In Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 7, the Bible says, In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. We live in a religious crazed world today. We live in a world today, and I'm talking about, I'm talking about Christianity now, or, or, or a weak brand of Christianity that the world is clinging to. We're living in an hour when people can talk about Jesus at one moment and talk about having a beer with the boys and the girls after work in the next moment. But I want to tell you, friend, I, I, knowing about Jesus won't get you to heaven. You've got to know him in a personal relationship and have the, the blood of Jesus Christ applied to your soul in order to be saved. The one wonder that we read about in, in this chapter in the ark provided light. That light, that window pictures Jesus Christ, the light of the world. John 8 and verse 12, he said, I am the light of the world. John 9 and verse 5, he again says, I am the light of the world. And then along with that, you had to be in the ark in order to be rescued from the flood. Just knowing about the ark, I mean, the people around knew about the ark. Uh, they've been, they've been walking and, and uh, going back and forth by that ark for, for a hundred years as Noah has been building it. They knew about the ark, but just knowing about it uh, from afar would not save them. And, and so it is with Christ. Uh, you must be in Christ in order to escape God's coming judgment. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. You had to make a personal decision to enter the ark. Notice that Noah was invited to come into the ark. And in the very same way today, uh, an individual has got to make a choice to receive Christ's offer of salvation. You, you can't make that choice for them. You, you, you can't constrain them to make that choice. Only the Spirit of God can bring conviction on their heart to do that. And only the Spirit of God can birth them into the body of Christ, into the family of God. God never, God never forces an individual uh, to, to make a decision, to trust Christ. He never forces his way into anybody's life. One other thought about the ark as a, as a picture of salvation here. You had to enter the ark through the ark's only door. There, was not, there, 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 were, there were not two doors. Never would have passed safety inspection today, Brother Tom. They, 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 would have, they, they would have shut building down if they'd found that the ark didn't have but one door to get in. But there wasn't but one door to get into the ark. You had to come God's only way of salvation. And that was through the door of the ark. That's, a, that's an Old Testament picture of New Testament truth. Jesus said in John chapter 10 and verse 9, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. John 14, verse 6, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. In Acts chapter 4, and verse 12, neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Not only do we see the reach of this salvation, Noah and his family. Not only do we see the rescue in this salvation, there was only one place of safety and that was in the ark. But then thirdly, we see the reason for this invitation. Notice, notice what the Lord says to Noah. In thee have I seen righteous. In thee have I seen righteous. 
He, God says to Noah, as I've looked down at the world uh, and, and I've looked, I have seen in you righteousness. Now, how did Noah become righteous? Did he come by carrying a, a Bible around? Well, he didn't even have Bibles in those days, friend. Somebody said, well, I, I must be going to heaven. I've got a Bible. It takes more than having a Bible to go to heaven. How, 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 how do you become right? Well, I, you know, I went to Sunday school. I got, a, I got a Sunday school pen. I missed 52 weeks without missing a single Sunday. Well, that's, uh, that's wonderful. It, it's a blessed thing to be faithful in church, Sunday school, and worship. But you don't become righteous by going to church. How do you become righteous? No, what the Lord is saying is, Noah, when I look at you, I see righteousness that I have created within you. I see my right. You see, that's the only righteousness that will satisfy God. The Bible says all our righteousnesses are as what? Filthy rags in God's sight. Yeah, your, your righteousness is never going to get you to heaven. You may, you may be a good daddy. You may be a good mother. You, you may be a good grandfather, a good grandmother. You, you may be a good parent. You may be all those things, but it's not your righteousness that's going to get you to heaven. It's going to be the righteousness of God's Son that he attributes to you, that he imputes to you when you trust Jesus Christ as your Savior that's going to get you to heaven. Noah was saved by grace. Look back at Genesis chapter 6 and verse 8. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. He was saved by grace. How do we know that? Look over to Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 7. And again, it's emphasized there in the book of Hebrews. That Noah was saved by grace, and therefore he was made righteous as a result of that in the sight of God. Once Noah was saved... He lived a godly and obedient life for the glory of the Lord. God saw righteousness in his life and then Noah lived in a way where the world could see the effect of that righteousness in his life. The Bible says that he walked with God. In Amos chapter 3 and verse 3, the Bible says, can two walk together except they be agreed? Are you walking with God? Does God agree with your way of life? I, I'm telling you, if God doesn't agree with your way of life, you are not walking with God. Can two walk together except they be... You're not walking with God uh, unless the Word of God is working in your life and you're living by the Word of God and God is pleased with your life as you're applying the truth of His Word in your life. Walking with God is the truly blessed life. Somebody said, what is the blessed life? It's walking with God. There, there's no better place to be than in that place of walking with the Lord. It brings blessings. It brings reward, rewards in life. You say, well, are you, are you telling me if I walk with the Lord, I'll have plenty of money? That's not what I'm saying. We've got our eyes on money and material things in this world to the point if we feel like if, we, if we're not being blessed with monetary things, God's not blessing us. Listen, if you've got God's air in your lungs this morning, he's blessing you. If you've trusted him and you've got another breath in your lungs, you're being blessed by God today. You're being blessed to sit here in this building this morning. Make sure you, you know this morning that in order to walk with God, you've got to be in agreement with God. As we look at the life of Noah here, we see how his obedience and his faithfulness to God paid off. How he was rewarded as a result of it. Uh, then we notice in these uh, final directives before the flood, uh, secondly, the, the final instructions concerning the ark itself. Look at, uh, look at verses, verse 2. He said, of every clean beast thou shalt take to thee by sevens, the male and his female, and a beast that are not clean by two, the male and his female. And fowls also of the air by sevens, the male and, fe and the female, to keep seed alive upon the face of all the earth. Look, look down at verse number 13. 
in the self same day, Noah, uh, day entered Noah and Shem and Ham and Japheth, the sons of Noah, and Noah's wife, the three wives of his sons with him into the ark. They and every beast after his kind, all the cattle after their kind, and every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth after his kind, and every fowl after his kind, every bird of every sort, and they went in unto Noah into the ark, two and two of all flesh, wherein is the breath of life. And they that went in went in male and female of all flesh, as God had commanded him, and the Lord shut him in. First of all, there are instructions concerning the creatures to be taken in. He's to take clean beasts by sevens. I read that. It seems sort of strange to me to begin with. He's he talking about the clean beast by sevens, and then, then, then he talks about the unclean beast, just, just taking a male and female of those. Well, uh, there were going to have to be sacrifices made while they were on the ark. Uh, sacrifices uh, uh, had to be made of clean animals. And so they would have taken extra animals for the sacrifices that needed to be made at the times they were to be made. He was to take one pair of unclean beasts. When it came to the fowls of the air, he was to take uh, seven pairs of the fowls of the air. And again, what you see here is, you, is God's mercy not only upon mankind in saving Noah's family, but also upon the animals in, in that uh, God made sure that representatives of each kind were preserved there on the ark. Then there were instructions not only concerning the creatures to be taken, but uh, instructions concerning the countdown to the flood. Look at verse 4. For yet seven days, and I will cause it to rain upon the earth forty days and forty nights. And every living substance that I've made will I destroy from off the face of the earth. Now it's evident here that the construction of, of the ark was complete. Methuselah has just died. And that, that again is a sign that God's judgment was about to fall. His, his name meant when I die it shall come, talking about the judgment of God. It could be, somebody said, well, what about that seven extra days? It could be that the remaining seven days served as a time for mourning for this man Methuselah. Uh, that, that was a common thing among the Jews, seven days to mourn the death of a loved one. And then at this point, God reveals to Noah that there are only seven days before the rain will begin to fall. Time was almost up for this God rejecting, the, the God rejecting world of Noah's day. What a challenge there is in this this morning for the hour that we're living in. God's clock is running down. Time is running out in our world today. God didn't reveal to us the exact time when he would return. We don't, we don't know the exact moment that he's going to return, but he did tell us in his word as it was in the days of Lot, so shall it be in the days of the coming of the Lord. And he did tell us that as it was in the days of Noah, so will it be in the days when Jesus returns. And so you and I, as we, we study Noah and the flood, and look at all that's going on here, we can know that God's clock is running out today. We're living, we're living near the rapture of the church, we're living near the beginning of the, the judgments of the tribulation period upon this world. We don't know the moment that it'll begin, but we know it's imminent. We know it's, it's nigh at hand. The Word of God tells us that. Every hour that passes, every minute that passes by, we're closer to the coming of the Lord. By the way, for those who are here looking at God's Word this morning, the challenge for each of us is even more relevant. We may not live till the rapture comes. It may very well be that most of us in this room 
will be in the presence of the Lord before the rapture takes place. The Bible says in Hebrews 9, 27, and as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. Nobody knows when that hour is going to come, when we're going to leave this world. But what we do know is that uh, whether we're alive or dead, we're going to face the Lord when life comes to an end. Notice the words of the Lord here concerning this coming judgment. He says, I will cause it to rain. God was the cause of the flood. Do you see that? God was the cause of the flood. It wasn't global warming that, that was coming about because of, uh, of, of carbon emissions that, that brought the, the flood that caused the, the, the terrible weather problem that came and the, and the mighty flood that covered the earth. It was God that brought judgment on this world. And let me tell you, if you're worried uh, about this green crowd today and all the garbage that they're trying to, sure, we ought to take care of the good earth that God's given us. We ought to keep it clean. We ought to do our best to be good stewards of what God's blessed us with. But I can tell you when, when, when time comes to an end, it won't be because of, 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 the, of the stupidity of man. It'll be because of the wickedness of man and God drawing the curtain on this thing and bringing time to an end. Again, we can see the totality of God's judgment here. Every living substance, every living substance. Now, I looked at that several times. What is that saying to us? It seems to me to include plant life as well as animal life, as well as human life when God's judgment comes on the world. What a great message there is in verses 5 through 9 and verse 13 and uh, the, the obedience, the compliance of Noah in all of this. Just as Noah has been faithful since the day God came to him, set him aside, challenged and called him to build the ark, God again speaks to him after a hundred years and begins to give him directives. And look at verse number five. And Noah did according unto all that the Lord commanded him. That speaks to us of the totality of Noah's obedience. There's no partial obedience here. I find a lot of Christians today who want to obey God selectively. They want to obey God here and they want to obey God there, but they don't want to obey God in other places. They're like King Saul in the Old Testament. They obey some things, but not all things that God requires. Let me tell you what partial obedience is. Are you listening to me? I don't want to make you uncomfortable this morning, but if this makes you uncomfortable, then that's the intent of it this morning. Partial obedience is nothing more than total disobedience. You can't take part of, of the Word of God and throw the rest of it out. You, you can't take part of it and obey and then disobey the rest of it. It's all the Word of God or none of it's the Word of God. Notice the trust of Noah's obedience here. Look at verse number seven. And Noah went in and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him into the ark because of the waters of the flood. Now wait a minute. The water has not come yet. That ark is still sitting on dry ground at this moment. It hadn't even started, there hadn't even been a sprinkle of rain when God invited Noah to come into the ark. There, there had been no indication that the judgment of God was coming. But what you see here in the life of Noah is faith in the word of God. God has said it and God's going to do it. And Noah obeyed by faith. Here's a man who had never seen it rain before. Study it. It had never rained up until this time. Up until this point, God had sent water up from the ground, uh, the moisture to, 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 to provide moisture for, for the world and, 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 uh, and uh, the, uh, the plant life. And it had never rained before. And yet God says to Noah, now you need to get in the ark 
because I'm going to send rain. And what does Noah do? He believed God's word. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 7 says, By faith, Noah. Why? Being warned of God of things not, a, not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world, and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. Noah trusted God. He believed the word of God. Somebody said, why, 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 are you, why are you preaching a message like this? Because I believe what God's word says. Why do you warn people that Jesus is coming and the end of the world is before us? Because I believe what God says in his word. Notice the timing of God's obedience here. Look at verse 13. In the self same day. Noah didn't call a committee meeting of his family and say, Now, what do y'all think about this? In the self same day. That means the very same day, right now. This means that Noah and his family took God's word seriously about the seven days that were left, and they entered the ark the very same day that the flood began. They believed in the absolute accuracy of God's word. One other important thing that I, that I saw here that we need to notice, and that, that involves the closing of the ark. Look, look at verse 16. And they that went in, went in male and female of all flesh, as God had commanded them. And then notice these last words. And the Lord shut him in. God closed the door. There are two great lessons that I believe are taught us here. First of all, a lesson concerning the salvation of Noah's family. God shutting the door here is a wonderful picture of the security of Israel, the nation first of all. And you've heard me say this time and again, and I say it again this morning, they are still God's people. God is not finished with the nation of Israel. Uh, he is going to protect them. You can count on that. Somebody said it looks like uh, support for Israel and all that's going on is beginning to wane. Don't worry about it. Don't, don't fret yourself over it. You ought to be concerned uh, about our nation turning its back on the nation of Israel because that, that will certainly bring God's judgment on America. But don't, don't fret over Israel because God is going to protect them. But it's not only a picture uh, of the security of Israel but it's a, a picture of, of, the, of the security of every believer, every child of God. God invited them into the ark of salvation and he sealed them safely on the inside. God shutting the door here is a reminder of the truth that the day of grace is not going to last forever. You and I are living in the sunshine of God's grace today. We're living in a time where every an invitation is given to trust Christ today. A person can be saved. But that, that day of grace will come to an end. From this moment on, those outside the ark were doomed. A serious time has come. And I'll tell you this morning, there comes a time when the door of opportunity is closed forever to those who are hardened in their unrepentant sin and and the judgment of God comes. What a challenge there is here for ev everyone who's not saved to trust the Lord Jesus Christ, to come into the ark of salvation while the door is open. 2 Corinthians 6 and verse 2 says, Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Isaiah chapter 55, 6 and 7, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call you upon him while he's near. Let the wicked forsake his way, the unrighteous man his thoughts. And let him return unto the Lord, and he'll have mercy upon him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. So we see God's directives here before the flood. But then we notice secondly the description of the flood itself. First of all, verses 10 and 11 give us a, a, a window of the day that the flood came. Look at it. And it came to pass after seven days that the waters of the flood were upon the earth. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the 17th day of the month, the same day were all the fountains of the great deep broken up and the windows of heaven were open. Two time markers are given us here. 
adding to the accuracy of the historical account of the flood. We, we have those even today who uh, would, would uh, dismiss the fact and even laugh at, at the idea of a worldwide flood. And yet here in the Word of God, we're, we're, given, uh, we're actually given two time markers setting the time when the flood began. We know it all happened within the sovereign timing of God at God's appointed time. God had revealed to Noah over a century earlier that there was going to be 120 years left before the flood came. And when that time period came to an end, God revealed to Noah that only seven days were left before the flood would come. And then we're told that it was the 600th year of Noah on the 17th day of the second month. Now, we don't know what calendar Noah was using. You, you understand this morning that uh, ca calendars that, that, there were, that have been used have changed down through the year. We don't know which calendar Moses was referring to when he wrote Genesis uh, 6, 7, and 8. So it's difficult to pinpoint the exact month the flood came. But the Bible tells us of the day that it came. But then also the Bible tells us about the way that it came. Look, look at the, the last part of verse 11 and verse number 12. The Bible said the same day were all the fountains of the great deep broken up. And the windows of heaven were open. And the rain was upon the earth forty days and forty nights. The flood waters came from two sources. First from below the earth. All the fountains of the deep were broken up. The, the, the subterranean pools of water, the water reserves that are underneath the earth uh, were, were broken up. There, 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 there were no doubt great uh, earthquakes during this time, turmoils when the, the crust of the earth was broken up and the waters from beneath came up. The words broken up mean to split or, or to break open, to burst open, to burst forth. Not only did the waters come from below the earth, but the Bible says they came from above the earth. The windows of heaven were opened. The word open there means to loosen. God released the waters from above the firmament. The Bible tells us in verse 12 that the rains persisted for 40 days and 40 nights. Now think about that. Non-stop rain worldwide, not, not, not just in the state of Georgia, not, not just in the, 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 the state of Maine, not, not just in Alaska, but worldwide non-stop rains for 40 days and 40 nights. I, I don't know where you watched any of the news Weather news especially coming out of, uh, of California. with uh, the, the, They've used the term atmospheric rivers with those, uh, with those uh, fronts that have been sweeping into California. They called it Pineapple Express because it all started as water was gathered up uh, by, by, in the atmosphere by the sun from Hawaii and, and God brought it across the Pacific into Florida and they, they show pictures of, 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 of that rain uh, over the past few weeks in California and streets, I mean houses washed away, cars washed away uh, landslides of, of all kinds the, the flooding has been horrific but it, but it starts raining and then it quits and then after a day or two, it starts raining again and it quits. Think of all this going on without any let up for 40 days and 40 nights. You, you talk about horrendous. The waters below coming up and the waters above coming down. So we see the, the description of the flood. But then in verses 17 through 24, the Bible gives us a picture of the devastation of, of the flood. Uh, the Bible talks about the prevailing of the waters. Look at verse 17. The, wa the flood was 40 days upon the earth. And the waters increased and bare up the ark and it was lift up above the earth. Can you imagine what's going on inside the ark? I mean, all of a sudden, this ark that's been sitting there on dry ground, no water around it at all, all of a sudden, they begin to feel that ark lifting off off the ground, it begins to float. And the waters, notice the word prevailed. 
That's a word you're going to see several times in these next verses. And the waters prevailed and were increased greatly upon the earth. And the ark went upon the face of the waters. And the waters prevailed exceedingly upon the earth. And all the high hills that were on the, the whole heaven were covered. Fifteen cubits upward did the waters prevail, and the mountains were covered. Four times the Spirit of God uses that word prevailed in, in, uh, in relation to the flood waters. That word prevail means to be strong. It, it literally means to conquer. What it's saying to us is that the waters were overwhelmingly mighty. All the high hills, the Bible says, were covered. And then the Bible gives us the depth of the water, 15 cubits. That, that, would, that would be equal to almost 23 feet in, in our terms of measurement today. 23 feet above everything. Not only do we see the prevailing of the waters, but the punishment. Look at verse 21. And all the flesh that moved upon the earth, both of fowl and of cattle and of beast and of every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth and every man, all in whose nostrils were the breath of life, of all that was in the dry land, died. And every living substance was destroyed which was upon the face of the gr ground, both man and cattle and the creeping things and the fowls of the heaven. They were destroyed from the earth, and Noah only remained alive. And they that were with him in the ark, and the waters prevailed, and that word is again, the waters prevailed upon the earth an hundred and fifty days. In Genesis 6, 13, God said, I'm going to destroy man with the earth. And in these verses, in the latter part of this chapter, that's exactly what happened. There was a complete destruction of animal life outside of those that were on the ark. There was a complete destruction of bird life except what was in the ark. A complete destruction of human life except that that was on the ark. And a complete destruction of plant life outside of what might have been on, on the ark itself. The only lives spared were those of Noah and his family and the animal life on board the ark of safety. Verse 24 tells us that the floodwaters prevailed over the entire earth for 150 days before they began to recede. Most of us get all discouraged. Most of us have depressive moods beyond imagination if it rains three days in a row. But can you imagine 40 days and 40 nights with no sight of the sun? Can you imagine 150 days without being able to see land anywhere? If you compare Genesis 7-11 and Genesis 8-13, you find it would be more than a year before enough land had been exposed to allow those on board the ark to leave. I'm telling you this morning, there is a message here, not only about what God has done, but there's a message about what God is going to do. I realize this morning that when all this was over, God promised that He would never destroy the world by water again. And He will not. In fact, God even gave a, a rainbow as a promise that He would never destroy the earth again with water. But God is going to bring destruction to this world one more time because of the wickedness and the vileness of humanity. The question for every person to ask and to answer in their heart this morning is, have you entered the ark of salvation? Have you trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? Are you sheltered under the atoning blood of Christ? If you haven't done that, then you need to come to Christ today and escape the terrible wrath that's coming upon this world. And then if you're saved this morning, if you belong to the Lord, you need to ask yourself the question, how important is obedience to God's Word in your life? Is, is God's Word as important to you as it was to, to Noah as he obeyed without question every word that God gave to him? Is that how important God's Word is to you this morning? The warning in all of this is don't wait too late because time's running out. I read again as I was studying for the message 
this morning. The story of a man by the name of Harry R. Truman, not Harry S. Truman, the 33rd President of the United States, but Harry R. Truman. Old Harry was a renegade. He was a bootlegger. He was, he was a drunk. He wound up living on the side of Mount St. Helens in Washington State. Operated a, a lodge there. He lived right at, right at, uh, right at the edge of uh, Spirit Lake. In 1980, there were all kinds of indications that Mount St. Helens was about to erupt. The volcano was about to erupt, destroying everything around it. For weeks, for weeks, before the eruption took place. Warning after warning was given. In fact, there were, there were you, you've heard of earth tremors, and I, I've experienced that down in Costa Rica. I woke up one morning, the, the, the year we took our young people down, and we were staying in a, in a, in a uh, we took the kids out to see a, an active volcano. I don't mean it's blowing up all the time, but it's got smoke coming out. And, and we were staying in a, in, a, uh, in a motel there, cement floor. And I woke up about 4 o'clock in the morning. Suddenly I woke up and my whole bed was shaking like that. And my first thought was some of them crazy kids got the key to my room. And they've gotten in here shaking my bed because that's what, that's what uh, well-trained, well-behaved Christian young people do to their preacher when they get him away. And I thought that's what it was. And, it, and then all of a sudden I realized that there wasn't anybody in that room but me. And it was a tremor. We were that close to that mountain. Well, there, there were all kind of tremors. In fact, they were so heavy that on several occasions, old, old Harry Truman was thrown out of his bed as a result of it. And they, they told him there's an eruption coming and, and, and you are not in a place of safety. Hi, he said, uh, this old mountain been doing this all my life. It, it, it's just playing tricks on everybody. And he said, if it blows, let her blow. Old Harry will go with her when she blows. The state even sent, the state of Washington even sent a crew out to Harry's Lodge the day before the, 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 the volcano erupted and said, Harry, you've got to leave. Get your cats. He had 16 cats. No wonder he died. He had 16 cats. And he, Harry wouldn't leave. On the morning of May the 18th, 1980, Mount St. Helens erupted. And Harry R. Truman's body along with the bodies of all of his cats were vaporized quicker than you could blink your eye by, by the heat of that volcano as, as it exploded and uh, then buried that entire side of the mountain where he was under 150 feet of volcanic debris. He had been warned and warned and warned and warned even the day before Mount St. Helens erupted. He was warned, you need to get out. And he failed to heed the warning. And he waited too late and he perished as a result. For a hundred and twenty years Noah, with a hammer in one hand and a saw in the other, preached faith in God, repentance of your sin, trusting the Lord Jesus Christ, giving your heart to God. For 120 years, he warned people, God is going to bring judgment upon this world as he built the ark. And they said, ha! Ah, no, I had never. No, rain, what in the world is that? Flood, there never been a flood. No, you're 600 years old. There never been a flood in your lifetime. What are you talking about? And yet he continued to warn and to warn and to warn and to warn. And on the day that God appointed, all the fountains of the deep broke up. And all the fountains above were opened. And the wrath of God came on this world. And the only people that were saved was Noah and his sons, his wife and their wives. 
And everybody outside the ark perished on that day. Oh, you say, preacher, what a horrible story. Yes, it was. Horrible for those who were lost and warned. Just that it'll be horrible for those that I love, that I care about, that you love, that you care about, and others that you don't even know how horrible it'll be for them on the day when God's judgment comes in this world. It's going to be a horrible day. But you know what? Inside that ark, Noah could rest with his arm. I can see him with his arm around his wife. I can see him as he gathered Ham, Sham, and Japheth and their wives around. And he said to them, let's bow our heads, children, and thank God for His mercy and grace in our lives and giving us faith to trust Him. And let's thank the Lord that we had the privilege to witness to people all around us. And we obeyed the Lord and we did our part. Now we're safe. And it's awful. No doubt there were now and then knocks on the side of that ark. No! Get the door open! But Noah couldn't open the door. Why? Because God had shut it. What God shuts, no man can open. It was too late. But Noah and his family were safe on the inside. Let's bow our heads. Would you please? Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. I wonder this morning, could it be possible that you're here and you've never trusted Christ as your Savior? If you haven't, I want to invite you to come and trust Him this morning. I wonder, could it be possible here this morning that as a Christian, you've been guilty as a lot of people are of taking God at His Word in some places and then just forgetting about God and His Word in other places. Could it be this morning that in your life you've not been faithful like Noah was to warn your family and to tell them that the judgment of God is coming? Maybe you need to talk to the Lord about that this morning. God's spoken to your heart and dealt with you this morning. Whatever He's dealt with you about, you need to be honest with Him and look to Him this morning. Father, thank You for Your Word. Thank You for these moments together in Your house of the time to preach this morning. As You've spoken to hearts now, I pray. You'd help folks to respond to you. In Jesus' name I pray. Would you stand with me please? Quietly, heads are bowed and eyes.